you like watching? In cinema? No. You want to guess what that means? Uh, everyone doesn't go to the cinema. I have no idea. I honestly have no idea what it is. I have no idea. Um, uh, no, actually I don't. One of my favorite examples to use is from a few years ago uh, when Ben Affleck um, cast himself, he was the director and the star, of Argo. And Argo is based on a true story uh, that happened. And the real CIA agent who did all those things, Tony Mendez, is a Mexican-American CIA agent. And so when Argo uh, was in pre-production and it was made clear that Affleck was going to play the role of Tony Mendez, there was some backlash uh, from the uh, Latino, Latina community because there was a feeling that probably a Mexican-American actor should play that role. I don't think it is normally an overt act of racism in and of itself. In other words, they're not, they, the makers of this film are not saying... You know, this is supposed to be a black guy, but let's use a white guy, or, you know, it's supposed to be an Asian guy, but we can find somebody, you know, we can make a look Asian, whatever. I think what it comes down to, like most things in the movie business, it comes down to money. Which, from an economic point of view, is probably true. But what that ignores is that we've already stacked the deck in terms of who gets to be stars. Something like, let's say, 75% of all lead roles in Hollywood are still played by white men, right? Uh, so there's a huge imbalance there already so to give away a role that really ought to go to a person of color by rights giving a role like that to a white guy is just sort of adding to this whole problem first we should look to the uh, uh, qualified actors that actually represent that minority group or ethnic group first right I'm sure we can find folks that can play that and then if you know then if we really can't maybe we turn to somebody else but um, I think that we need to give more people an opportunity to be representative of, of what's out there. Um, yeah, we should provide more opportunities for uh, minority groups to act um, in roles not just specified, you know, hey, we need a, an Asian person for this. So uh, one of my favorite examples of that is Mississippi Burning. There's a lot of them, but it, Mississippi Burning in 1988, also an award-winning film. I think it was nominated for Oscars and so forth. Um, a film about the civil rights movement in the 60s and incidents that took place in the American South. But in the film, it's two white FBI agents. We're back with the FBI again. Two white FBI agents go down there and kind of clean things up and find these racists and, and solve the problem. Whereas in reality, the historical reality was the complete opposite. Somebody, you know, we can make a look Asian, whatever. I think what it comes down to, like most things in the movie business, it comes down to money. Mm -hmm. And the producers who spend a lot of money, I think the average production, and this was years ago that I heard this, was like $60 million for the average Hollywood film. It's probably more than that now. And then you got to pay almost that same amount again to market it. Well, when you put that kind of money down, these guys who do it, the suits, the producer types, and the bankers, mm -hmm. they want protection. They want protection for their investment. And the, the way you get protection is you get a star, because that helps though. Sometimes you get a film that, that people already know what it is because it's a sequel or something like, or inspired by, or a true story, or things that, they, that you, know, you know going in, the audience sort of knows what they're going to get. And you usually, they think, you need to get at least some prominent white casting. One of the common defenses that we hear when we uh, talk about whitewashing, as soon as some group raises the issue that, hey, wait a minute, this is a character who should be played by an actor of color or an actor of the same ethnicity as the real-life person was, um, the usual defense that we will hear from the filmmakers is, well, we need to cast stars. We need to cast big name, you know, stars in order to draw people to the film. Kind of flies on the radar. Not a lot of people are thinking about this, you know, the representations that are out there and why do we have predominantly uh, white uh, actors in all these programming, uh, programs on television or in the movies. So unless we really stop to think 
then it's uh, it's going to continue. Predominantly white populations, the expectation is is that other ethnic groups fade into the background of your everyday experience. So when they're not there, you don't notice. And so for these populations, they wouldn't see it as whitewashing. What they would see is it's their everyday experience. You know, we talked about fear before, this fear of the unknown. The fear of the unknown related to the um, producers of these movies and television shows is that fear of what if we change this character from a white male to something else. They don't know what will happen. Will they lose viewership? Will they lose money? And so a lot of the thinking might be, if it's not broke in their minds, why fix it? Now, sometimes it's absolutely impossible, but, but not totally impossible. I mean, there was a, I just saw, a, I just recently saw Straight Outta Compton, a film I had great admiration for. I was kind of surprised because I don't like rap, but I, but I really dug the movie and I thought it had a lot of energy and I also told me an interesting cultural story I didn't know. But there they do have, legitimately, Paul Giamatti playing a white guy who was the manager of the group for a while. Uh, and he's not shown in a good light, by the way, because he kind of screws the guys. So, so you know, that, that, but still, they could put Paul Giamatti on a billboard for the film, and that can help, because he's a well-known and highly respected actor. And, and so that can help them sell a movie that would otherwise maybe be even more difficult to sell than it already is. I mean, a black rap movie for middle America is going to have trouble. But it made it big uh, because it turned out to be a good film. Um, so anyway, it's, it's economics. In other words, they, they are afraid. And, and sometimes, I mean, I read an interview with the, the director uh, uh, who I admire, Ridley Scott, when he made Exodus, Gods and Kings, which I just saw on a plane two days ago, by the way. Uh, and he had, you know, all white guys and women playing these Egyptian characters, Egyptian or Jewish characters, who being in the Middle East would be darker, generally. And... Uh, and he said when he went to get financing for the movie, he couldn't get it unless he cast white actors. And so we need to look at those examples. And by we, actually, now I don't mean we including me. I mean the business, the film business needs to look at those examples and say, wait a minute, look, these are films by foreign about people of color or by foreign about women, and they're enormously profitable. Obviously, we are not thinking this through quite right when we continue to favor white men and their stories and white male stars. These other movies can be profitable. The film business, particularly at the highest levels of it in Hollywood, they have so much money. So if the writers are 87% white, then the stories that they tell are going to reflect that racial and cultural perspective. Again, not necessarily bad, but then that means that the 13% of the other writers in the industry, they have to make a significant case for why we need a television show that features Asian Americans, that isn't a, isn't a show that's off, based off of a stereotype in terms of fresh off the boat, um, or, um, or in terms of African Americans, like to say like, hey, we want an African American TV show that isn't about crime. So there's this huge disparity, so that's, one factor is that there's just not a lot of diversity in terms of the production side. The second factor is that even though there are spots and places of diversity, the people who are in the positions in terms of calling the shots about which shows get um, the green light, which ones don't, the diversity is even smaller. So again, if we have roughly 13 to 17 percent who are writers, well then how many are producers? And so um, there's a, this particular TV show. We've seen this wave of very successful shows that have diverse casts, whether it's Blackish or it's Empire. And how much pressure do all of you feel now to populate your rooms with diverse writers and also the pressure to cast actors who aren't white? <laughs> no, this. <laughs> uh, look at all these white people. <laughs> I love that. You're so funny. Why would you ask that damn question? It's a good question. Oh it's a relevant God. question. Is there a pressure now to make your shows more diverse it's, uh, in front of and behind the camera. The contributing factor, factors that can lead to whiteness is one, like I said, the lack of overall diversity or whitewashing, lack of overall diversity, and then two, that even where there is diversity, typically not in positions of power. Okay, and what do you think we can do as individuals? Um, I think just putting it on social media, how it's not okay. I've noticed that they have been doing that campaigns with like costumes and like how the like extremes of somebody's culture is like 
portrayed with costumes. I think like showing people it's not okay and like how we should take the initiative and just like even boycott movies that do it. This is one area where the internet has served us well. There are a lot of folks now who are doing cultural criticism, doing film criticism, and raising awareness about this sort of thing via online sites. Um, I read one called Racialicious. There's also one called Race Bending. These are sites that really monitor stuff like this that's going on in our, our media. I definitely think it should educate people, especially white people and with black people, people who are used to it, you know? There are some people who see it like a black person who knows it's easier than a white person, you know, but I think everybody should be it. It's on us to be aware of what we're viewing. I don't think it's realistic for us as film goers to like boycott every racist film or boycott every sexist film. If we did that, we would never be able to go to the movies. Um, but we can be aware of the films that we support and we can, um, we can draw lines for ourselves about what we want to support with our ticket buying dollars. But beyond that, you would hope that people would write about it. Critics like myself would maybe write about it. And every time I've ever written anything about Breakfast at Tiffany's, I'll talk about the despicable casting of Mickey Rooney. Not that it was Mickey's fault, but it was, you know. The fact that he got cast in that role did not work. Uh, so writers can write about it, people can talk about it. The other thing is to support films that do it right. The, the reason I've loved movies since I was a kid is that they do expose me to a wider world. And, you know, thanks to movies, I've been on top of Mount Everest, and I've marched with Dr. King, and I've been uh, explored in the jungles, and I've, I've been in the Old West, and I've had all these great experiences. And I'm grateful for them, and that's one of the things that films do, but I want those experiences to be fair and balanced with what the world is like, and that includes casting, and that includes writing. And, and I never wanted to have anything spoon-fed down me. I want it to be just told to me in a way that I am fascinated by and, and thankful for. And, and that's why I love films. And this, you know, re re reducing this issue of whitewashing would be a great part of it. But you know, there's lots of other issues that come into play in making sure we get honest and good and enjoyable and entertaining and enthralling storytelling. We need stories. Mm -hmm. Society needs stories. That's what we're all about. We, we live on them. We learn from them. We try to go on and do more because of them. We need stories. And so let's get them right.